All right, hi. Um, my name is Will, and I work on and with distributed systems and machine learning at Red Hat. And, uh, I'm Eric, and I work on Will's team, and uh, you know, I work on uh, with Will on the uh, Rad Analytics uh, .io community, and uh, we explore uh, you know use cases for intelligent apps in the cloud today. So. Thanks for joining us for the workshop. Today we're going to talk about sketches, which are these really cool probabilistic data structures that let you get an approximate answer for interesting questions, but that you can run incrementally, in parallel, or on streams uh, while only using constant space. So who here deals with big data? I, I, see, I see a lot of like uncertainty. What, what do you think of as big data? Something that you can't process on a single machine. That's a great definition, Marcel. I, I would agree with that, actually. Like it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be enormous, right? You're not gonna you don't need to get into you're not gonna need a territory, you just need to get into something where you have to do distributed computing. I uh this work. But the uh, the sort of dirty secret about big data is that everyone sort of wants to have big data or maybe people don't want to have big data or feel like they should have big data, but most problems don't require more than a single machine, right? You can you can scale up for many problems, but there are some problems where you have to have to scale up, or some problems where you have to use a streaming algorithm, and those are the kinds of problems that you're going to be able to solve with these techniques. So I want to just sort of, as by way of background, introduce the technique the first time that I actually needed to do big data, right? And this is a very simple problem, right? I was always convinced that like there's some some value in being able to have distributed or parallel algorithms, but I never actually needed it to get work done, right? I was like, oh, that might make it faster. That that might make it better in some way. But the first time that I actually needed it to get work done, I was doing compiler research. Um, anyone here have a background in compilers or computer architecture? Okay. So you done sim simulation at all? A little bit. So, so when I was doing this work, and I, not to age myself, but when I was doing this work, what you would do is you would you would compile a program with your research compiler for some imaginary instruction set that was related to probably the DEC Alpha or x86 or, or MIPS, um, <laughs> and uh, then you'd run it on a simulator, and the simulator would be cycle accurate, so the simulator would know how many cycles of latency a memory access was, and so on but the simulator was extraordinarily slow. Like if you had one of the spec benchmarks, which are very simple integer and floating point programs, um, running like 30 seconds of wall clock time of a spec benchmark would take you like a week, right, on the simulator. So what do you wanna do? Well, you wanna characterize whether or not the optimization you've done improves your cache performance. Well, how do you do that? Well, you run it on a cycle accurate simulator and you track the cache latencies, right? track the mean and, mean and uh, variance of the cache latencies. Well, if it takes a week to run your simulation, you're generating a ton of data, right? Every time you access memory, you have a cache latency. You're generating too much data to keep around, right? You need to look at each sample once and say, this is going to contribute to my mean and variance, and I need to update my estimates. You can't replay the simulation, you know. I mean, if you're thinking of like the textbook method for mean invariance, you pass over the data set once and get a sum of the samples. Then you divide the number of samples to get the, you divide the sum by the number of samples to get the arithmetic mean. And these, uh, this is very faint on the projector, but we have a, a box there. And, and so we, in the second pass, you calculate the difference between each sample and the mean, and then you can uh, calculate the variance by, by getting the, the sum of those squared differences. Now, if you're doing this on a stream of data that's too big to keep around, and that takes a week to generate, do you want to take two weeks just to get mean and variance? No. I, I, didn't, I didn't suggest this to my advisor at any point. Um, yeah, but, but yeah, so you don't want to do this. You need, you need a way to do this in place. So 
This technique, the textbook method for doing this, works really well for data sets that are small. If you've never really thought about mean invariance at scale, this is, this is what you think of when you think of, if you think of mean invariance, to the extent that you think of mean invariance, this is what you think of, right? So I actually discovered at, at some point, sort of accidentally, um, you know, that there's, that there's a way to do this for these kinds of data sets that you can't keep around. And it seemed like magic to me. And so my hope is that the, some of the other structures we'll talk about will seem like magic as well. And we'll see this one in action right now. And again, this is, uh, this is very faint, I apologize for that. But um, instead of thinking of our population, which we can sort of, sort of see if we squint, as, as a set or as a, a collection that we can pass over as many times as we want, we're gonna think about it as a stream. So we'll examine one sample at a time. And after we examine a sample, we'll get an estimate and we'll update that estimate. So here's our mean estimate after looking at one sample. We've seen one sample. So the mean is same. the same, right? Yeah. <coughs> that's, that's an easy case. Our variance is it's a little trickier. It's undefined. You know, we need two samples for a variance. Um, but zero, I would take zero too, I guess. So, <laughs> um, so when we look at the second sample, we're going to look at its difference from our current estimate of the mean. So we don't need an estimate for the whole population. We just need an estimate for the mean. And I'm representing that here as a blue line. And we'll update our estimate of the mean by sort of splitting the difference between these, sort of getting a weighted average of what we've already seen and what we're currently seeing. Um, so we'll update it by half of the difference. And then we have an initial estimate of our variance. Now, variance has this sort of interesting property that the, you can take the variance with respect to any number, right? It's, it's, sort, of, it's sort of invariant uh, with respect to the mean, but the closer that number that you pick is to the mean, the better your estimate will be. So we're gonna, we can actually just sort of use our rolling mean estimate to update our variance estimate as well. And that was the thing that seemed like magic to me because I didn't pay attention in that part of the first week of high school statistics. Um, so as we go on, we update our estimates and so on. Uh, here we, we're doing a weighted average, so we update by a third of the difference for the third sample. And you can see, um, again, if you squint, sort of how the variance estimate changes over time and how the mean estimate changes over time as well. And the, we actually land at the end of the algorithm on the actual arithmetic mean for the whole stream. We, so we get a pretty precise estimate of that, uh, precise and accurate, and uh, we land fairly close, but not exactly at the variance uh, by doing this in a streaming way. And the cool thing about the summary we get from this online algorithm is that we can combine it with other similar summaries, right? So if I have two streams that I want to combine, um, say I'm running two different programs and I want to get the, uh, the some, some average from metrics that I'm measuring on both of them, I can uh, get a summary for one and I can get a summary for the other, and I can just combine these as weighted averages the same way that I would get an update my estimate incrementally um, for, for the uh, case where we're adding a single sample at a time. So mean invariance is cool. If you hadn't thought about mean invariance, it's, it's sort of neat to think about the fact that you can do this. It's not why anyone is here, right? You don't want, we're, we're done with mean invariance, right? We don't want to talk about this anymore. We don't, we don't really want to deep dive into mean invariance, do we? I'm just, just making sure that we're all on the same page. Okay. Yeah, so this is cool, but the reason why I'm showing it is primarily to show this is why I started thinking about this topic a long time ago, but also to show some properties it has that all of the structures we're going to talk about today have. The, the first one is that it's incremental. You can run this algorithm on a stream. You only need to examine each thing once. If you have one of these situations where you're running a simulation that takes a super long amount of real world time to run and generates a ton of data, you don't want to keep those metrics around. You want to throw them away. So you, this is incremental, and we can update our summary by looking at a new sample once with a single pass over a data set. The second property we have is that this is a parallel algorithm in that if you have two summaries for subsets of the data, you can combine them 
to get a summary of their union. That's really valuable because it means that you can scale processing out. And finally, this technique is scalable, which means that whether you process one sample or one trillion samples, your summary is going to use the same amount of space. Um, yeah, I guess. Thanks. Um, how many people here understand uh, the connection between being able to merge two of these structures and being able to compute them in parallel? To so if you can easily merge them, then it's possible to process them parallel. If it was not possible, or, or if it was difficult, then uh, how, how can you merge them, right? So uh, yeah. if you cannot merge the results, is there any way you can process uh, in parallel the, uh, the parts? Yeah, like so if we can compute independent summaries of the subsets and combine those summaries without losing a lot of information, right? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, you know, the Spark or before that Hadoop model where, you know, you can compute one of those things for each piece of data on each physical node if they're residing across nodes and then you can, you know, combine the results and so it allows you, it allows you to do pieces in parallel and, you know, at the end merge to get a final result. Yeah. Yeah, so if you had if you had a a stream that you were processing in parallel say with Kafka where you have, you know, a topic a topic of messages is distributed across multiple machines, you could generate one of those streams for each partition of your topic and then combine them together. Um, also if you're processing a stream, you could generate a summary for each day, right, and combine those together. That's that's sort of another another valuable option there. Um, but yeah, by, by being able to combine these, you can do it. You can do it in parallel. So the last thing is, is that this is, this is scalable, though. And it doesn't matter whether we've processed a few samples or many samples. Again, these, these samples are very faint. But we see that we have a summary of fixed size. So before I started thinking about these kinds of problems, if you would have asked me, what's scalable? Right? What does it mean to be scalable? Like, so if I said, I have something that grows linearly with the number, I mean, if I said I have something that grows quadratically with the number of things it, it processes, well, that doesn't scale. It's a cubic, no way, right? Um, if you say linear, eh, maybe, maybe. Logarithmic, yeah, now we're sounding pretty good, right? You, you, logarithmic space, logarithmic time, that's, that's, if I say that's scalable, you're not going to argue with me, right? OK, argue with me, Marcel. you will reach a limit. Exactly right. But in this case, if you can slice it, so uh, then I won't reach a limit besides the amount of money that I have to buy new machines. But the limit is basically the amount of machines that I'm able to buy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so I think that's, I think the, the, and here, since we're talking about the amount of space that the summary takes up, if you're saying, I want to process log records from a data center for an internet company forever, right? Logarithmic growth is unacceptable <laughs> because you're going to buy more machines just to store your summary. So, you know, Marcel, you've, you've spent a lot of time thinking about processing metrics, so you, you sort of have a leg up on this discussion. But in general, like, if you're not thinking about this kind of data processing, logarithmic time or space is fine, right? But for these problems, we don't know how much data we're going to process. It might be it might be so enormous that even something that grows logarithmically is unacceptable. We need something that's a fixed size. And the structures that we're going to look at today let us choose trade-offs between how much space we're going to use, how much constant space we're going to use, and how much precision we want in answering questions. So that's, that's really, really powerful. And so I think my hope is that, um, you know, one of my hopes is that we can read the rest of the slides better than we can read this one. But, um, but, but my hope is that sort of looking at some of these techniques, you'll see some of the magic behind them and sort of get inspired to try, try new things with data. So before we move on, um, who here is able to, if you're able to deal with a QR code, um, scan this and open it up on your computer because that'll take you to an interactive notebook that we'll be using for the rest of the talk. If you're not able to deal with a QR code, just type in this URL. Can you 
actually scan it on like your phone and then bring it up on your computer? Yeah, sure. yeah if you have Mac. <laughs> <laughs> you can scan it on your phone and airdrop it to yourself. <laughs> especially, especially if you're if you're on the Wi-Fi, right? Ah, uh, yeah. If if it were possible to still buy a Windows phone. All right. So, is anyone having trouble getting to this this location here? All right, so we'll, we'll be talking more about that in, in just a second. Um, here's what we're going to talk about today, though. We're going to start by looking at, we're going to look at a few different problems. Uh, we're going to start by looking at approximate set membership. We'll cover in some slides, we'll talk about the bloom filter, and then we have a notebook where we can play with the bloom filter a little bit and see how it works. The next thing we'll do is talk about counting distinct events. Eric will introduce a data structure called the count min sketch and go through a notebook where we see how to use that to count distinct kinds of events in a stream. Then I'll cover a data structure called hyperloglog, log, which enables us to get extremely precise cardinality estimates of very large sets with a very small amount of space. So imagine if you're looking for a unique search queries as a search engine, or if you're thinking about what the most popular, um, or if you think about unique visitors to a popular website, like you need some way to say how many things are in a set without keeping the entire set around. We'll quickly look at a technique for set scalable set similarity called minhash, and then Eric will cover a really cool data structure called the t-digest which produces accurate quantile estimates. So not just mean invariance, but what's the median, what's the 90th percentile, what's the 99th percentile, and so on. Okay. So let's start by looking at set membership. And set membership is a really interesting problem. It's, it's fundamental to a lot of other data processing problems, but it also has applications in systems. And we'll start by looking at an application in systems. Let's say you're writing a caching proxy and you default to caching any web page that someone requests. Right. Makes sense, right? You store it in the cache, you have an eviction policy, and you know eventually things get expired out of the cache. So as you continue to get requests, the size of your cache is going to grow, and you'll have more things in the cache. But web requests, like a lot of other things, there's a really long tail. Like there are a lot of things that only get requested once. Like the page you get after you complete an online purchase is probably, you're probably only going to land on that once. No one else is likely to land on that, you know, exact content, hopefully. Um, and, and, uh, and there's really no reason for that to be in the cache. So you're using up resources in the cache, eventually they get evicted, but um, you're using up resources that you could more productively use for other things. We want a way, instead of caching everything that people ask for, to only cache things that someone has asked for more than once. So the way we can solve this problem, how do we know if someone has asked for something? Well, is it in the cache? But we only want to cache things that are going to be asked for more than once. Do we need a cache for our cache? A meta cache? But yeah, yeah. I mean, so but but we don't want to we don't want to keep an explicit set. Yeah. So so if if um, if if you I mean we could keep we could keep a list of you know hashes of things. You know we could we could approximate it somehow. Um, and and that's that's a uh, that's actually sort of what it'll look like. But but if we if we said we're only going to cache things that get requested more than once, we might uh, we might uh, have a way to sort of use fewer resources in our cache and provide better performance. So what we'll do is we'll maintain a set of things that we've been asked for, and we'll only put something in the cache if someone's asking for it, and it's also in the set of things that we've already been asked for. Now, we can't actually keep everything we've been asked for in this set of things that we've already been asked for, or else we just have, we're just using twice as much space as we would be using if we were caching everything. So we need some structure that says, has this probably been asked for, right? 
And that's what the structure that we're going to we're going to look at does. The Bloom filter is a way to answer this question approximately. Say, given a very large set of things, is something in the set? Can I add something to the set? You know. And this isn't actually this actually isn't a made up example. This is uh, the Bloom filter is a very old data structure. It's it's almost 50 years old, but the um, Akamai was able to use this, um, you know, around the turn of the century, to really improve the performance of their content distribution network. So this is this is actually a real example um, here. But before we look at how we would solve this with a scalable data structure, let's see how we would do it precisely. Right. We want to maintain a set. See if something's in a set. This is maybe going to be going back several years for some of us. But let's think about how we'd represent a set. Well, one way to do it is we could have an array. If we have a small number of things, we just have an unsorted array, and we assume that the overhead of sorting the list is actually going to be outweighed by just scanning through and looking for the thing that's in the set. If we have a larger set of things that admit some kind of ordering, we could store it as a tree. And just say, search through the tree and see if we find the thing. And if we find it, it's in the set. And if we don't, it isn't. Another approach to representing a set precisely, though, we could just use a hash table. Right. Hash tables are super useful. And if we store keys, where the keys are the set elements and the values are whatever we want them to be, one, true, it doesn't matter. We're just keeping track of the keys here. So recall how a hash table works. You have a put operation where you provide a key and a value. And then we have a hash function, which maps from an arbitrary value to a relatively small integer. That hash function is used to look up a bucket in an array where we'll then put that value. And in this case, we're not putting just a value, but we're putting a list of values. Because if we have two things that land on the same bucket, we'll need to put something else there. We'll see what that looks like in a second. Eventually, we have a lot of other things in our hash table. And maybe we have an extremely bad hash function that was never used by someone with a contrived example because foo and bar are hashing to the same value. If we land in the same bucket, when we, when we want to put something in that hash table, we'll see that it's not already there. And we'll have to use some more space to handle this collision. So in this case, we had a, a collision because we had a contrived example. But in general, the size of your hash table is not going to be as large as the size of the space of keys that you're putting into it. So you're going to have these collisions eventually if you put enough things in the hash table. This is, this is review. I'm not surprising anyone so far, right? OK. So, so when we have one of these collisions, though, we pay a time penalty and a space penalty. We pay the time penalty because we have to sort of check all the things in this list. We pay a space penalty because we have to add some things to the end of the list. And it's bad on your cache. And it's, it's just not great in, in a bunch of ways. So if we want to compute scalably, we don't want the time to increase or the space to increase. So the Bloom filter is a hash-based data structure that uses a fixed amount of space and constant time. And instead of having those time and space penalties, it has a precision penalty. So when your Bloom filter fills up, you'll get false positives. Let's see how it works. So we want to handle large amounts of data in a fixed amount of space with a constant amount of time per query. So we have a fixed number of buckets. We don't, we don't resize. We don't have lists. Um, the values we care about storing are either true or false. So we can use a vector of bits, which saves us some space over storing arbitrary keys. Um, when we insert something into the Bloom filter, we use a hash function to look up what bucket we're going to put it in, and we set that to true. Notice that nowhere in the Bloom filter are we storing what we've actually put into the Bloom filter. Right? We're, just, uh, we're just setting it to true. So if we have a hash collision, we'll automatically get a false positive. Right? If we have something else going into that bucket, we don't know if it's that thing or something else. So the Bloom filter limits the 
likelihood of these false positives by using multiple hash functions. You may have a collision with one hash function, but you're less likely to have one with several hash functions. And the way this works, then, is when you put something in, you set all of the values, all of the buckets to true, and when you want to check to see if something is in the set, you return true if they're all true, and you return false if any of them is false. So if we update this again to insert bar, we have one collision out of three, but it doesn't really affect us uh, because the other two have not collided. So when we look up, um, we're going to look up foo, and this is, uh, this is unfortunately too faint to see. Um, but, but when we look up foo, we see that uh, all of the, all of the uh, buckets that foo hashes to are true. And similarly with bar, if we look something up that's not in the hash table, it, maybe it hashes to this bucket that's zero, and that uh, we know definitively that we haven't put that in the filter. But we might have something where we have a collision for all three of our hash functions. And in that case, we'll look something up and get a, uh, get a false positive result because even though we haven't put blah into the filter, some other things that we've put collided with all of the hash functions that we'd use for this. So in practice, you'd use more than you know, 16 bits for your Bloom filter, but um, you know, the larger it is, the less and the more hash functions you have, the less likely you are to get false positives. And we'll see how that, we'll see how that looks um, in a minute. So, one cool aspect of this that's, that's not going to be super obvious on this slide is that you can, um, you can merge these together. So if I have uh, two filters, one of which I've inserted foo into and one of which I've inserted bar into, um, I can use bitwise or to get the union of these two filters, combining them together. So this is where we get the parallel aspect. And this uh, filter is actually going to have, it's going to be equivalent to if we'd constructed one from all the things that we're taking a union, union of. So you can estimate whether or not something's in the union of several sets, even if you can't keep those sets in memory. If you're uh, using some scale out uh, compute platform, you can process multiple partitions of a data set, compute Bloom filters for each, and then combine those together to get an estimate for the entire data set that's too big to process on a single machine. And if you're algebraically inclined, or if you just sort of think about these kinds of things, you may be saying, well, I get something interesting with bitwise, or could I get something interesting with bitwise and? And the answer is you can. And as you might imagine, the interesting thing you get is an approximation of the intersection of two sets with and. So the interesting thing about that intersection is, in this case, um, if we look up either of these things, we, we will we'll see that you know, if we have a Bloom filter that just contains foo and one that just contains bar, they have one bit in common. And if we look up either of these, we will see that it's not in that intersection. But in general, that intersection is going to have a higher false positive rate than if we would have done the intersection before we constructed a Bloom filter. All right, so I'm going to. So if this uh, blue filter becomes too, too full, uh, like uh, there are way too many uh, bits, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sorry, uh, too little bits and way too many, uh, way too many uh, uh, values, then it uh, just uh, gives back a false positive for everything. Yes. Yeah, when the blue, uh, I mean, eventually every bit will be set to true and you'll get a yeah. false positive for everything. So, so is there any, like, uh, Yes. Yes. So I think actually, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause. So there is. Well, we're gonna cover it in the notebook. I actually have a, a slide for a formula, but I'd rather cover it interactively so we can see a plot. Um, are there questions about the Bloom filter so far? Yes. Can you increase the size of the Bloom filter on the fly? 
In general, so there, there are people who've sort of looked into ways to do this. In general, you can't. Um, I mean, there, there's, there's, there's some approaches that, that work better than others, but in general, like, because you don't know what's in each of those buckets, you'd need to sort of maintain some additional information to try and, to try and resize. Um, and you'd, you'd lose, some, or, you'd tr or you'd lose some precision or have, have false negatives as well as false positives. Um, so you, picking the size is important, but we'll see, we'll see how to choose good trade-offs for that um, in, in a bit. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead and talk about uh, an application real quick. And the first application from the paper where, where Bloom introduced this structure is um, actually a hyphenation dictionary. So um, the language I know of where hyphenation, I mean, hyphenation is complicated in general, right? I know that, um, I know that in, in many natural languages, you actually have to change the spelling of a word when you hyphenate it. Um, and it's not, always, it's not always a simple rule to hyphenate something. So Bloom's example was that you have a dictionary of a natural language that has the rules for hyphenating words. And most of the words, like say 90% of the words, you can hyphenate with a heuristic, and it'll be correct. But for that 10%, you need to do something special. Maybe you need to change the spelling of the word. You need to like hyphenate in a way that's not obvious from the heuristic. Now, this is the part that's going to be hard for everyone in this room to imagine. But neither the dictionary nor the set of words that required special treatment would fit in main memory on the computer Bloom was using. So what do you do instead? Well, you don't want to just keep the dictionary on disk because then you have to hit the disk for every word to see whether or not you needed to hit the disk for every word. The disk is so much slower than memory. You don't want to touch it if you don't have to. So the Bloom filter enables you to say, well, is this maybe something that I'd have to hit the disk for or definitely not? Right? You can say maybe or definitely not. And as long as your false positive rate isn't too high, you'll get much better performance by having this approximate structure to say if something is something you care about. There are a lot of other really cool applications of Bloom filters um, involving like uh, distributed databases and, um, and a lot of systems topics. But I could talk about applications or we could go to the notebook and we could play with it. What do we want to do? Yeah, it was a question. Thank you, Marcel. I, <laughs> I, the check is in the mail. <laughs> All right. So um, I'm going to pause this slideshow here, and uh, we'll go over to the notebook. And I'm going to load that up. And should get something that looks like this. <coughs> It's making it unnecessarily difficult for me to move this onto the other screen. There we go. Okay, and if this doesn't load, I will just access the one that's running locally on my computer. But is anyone having trouble getting into that URL I sent out earlier? Just me. Okay, great. Um, oh, there we go. <laughs> All right. So what we're gonna what we have here is we have a Jupyter notebook. Um, I'll ask if if people in here have used Jupyter notebooks before. Yeah. Has anyone not not used a Jupyter notebook? We will explain what's going on in these. Um, but basically, this is a bunch of files that are that are Python files that are sort of narration and code interspersed together. And I'm just gonna click on this one that says Bloom filters. If you want to see the mean and variance estimates, you can click on this top one, but we're not going to cover it uh, today. And I'm going to click on this Bloom filters, and there are two things you need to know about notebooks. The first is press Shift Enter on any cell to evaluate that cell and move to the next cell. The second thing you need to know about notebooks is that if you get really stuck, you can restart your notebook um, and clear the state of the Python interpreter that's behind that notebook. 
So this is running on shared infrastructure, and I'm currently tethered to my phone so that I'm not dependent on Wi-Fi. So that's why it's taking a little longer for me to load than it may be for, for everyone. So uh, again, we have, um, you know, we have text, we have images, and we have code. And this is just sort of an explanation of the Bloom filter. These notebooks are available. You can access this URL at any time. It's running on a public service. You can go back and do, do whatever you want with these. Um, but we're going to sort of build up a Bloom filter implementation starting from a bit vector. So we'll go through. And this is just uh, Python code. Are people comfortable with, comfortable with reading Python code? Is anyone not comfortable with reading Python code? If the, OK. so. I'll explain what's going on, and if, if anything is not clear, if there's something that's unidiomatic I've done in this code, or if it's just new to you, please raise your hand and ask a question. That's, that's what we're here for. So what we're, what we're doing here is we, when we construct a new Bloom filter, we give it a size, which is the number of bits in the filter, and we give it a set of hashes. Um, and hashes can either be a, a so, so hashes we can either take as a function that returns multiple hashes or a list of functions, each of which returns a single hash. So the actual code for this winds up being pretty simple. The insert method, you look at all of the hashes that you have, and for every hash, you set the hash bucket to true when you insert some new thing into the Bloom filter just like we did in this picture. The lookup method also winds up being pretty simple. Um, we look up the bucket for each hash, and if any of them is false, we return false. And if we get to this point, all of them are true. So we return true. And that's your basic bloom filter right there. It's, it's very cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, so what I'm doing here is I'm taking the, the hash value. Oh, no, sorry. The, the, the initialization method, like the fault dot hash value. Yeah. 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 Right there. Why is size equals the length of the bucket? Shouldn't it be the same as the size you have as an input to this method? Hmm. Why do you need to calculate that size? Well, just above here, you could just say, you could have said size, but he's just saying, I already created bucket, so I'm just using Oh, bucket. hang on. There's, there's a reason why I'm doing this. Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe this is just that I did something dumb in the notebook. Let's, let's pick this up offline. I don't, I don't remember. So, yeah, so I mean, the size of the bit vector is like the size in, in, um, is the size in bits rather than the size in yeah. integers. So that, that you're actually representing the bit vector as. So um, that's a great question. Um, and. I should have a better answer for it, but uh, since I wrote this code. <laughs> um, all right, so we're in the, we're in the boom filter, and um, I'm not going to dive into hashing, but basically, if you need a bunch of hash functions, you can always use a hash function that returns a lot of bits and just take a few of the bits in a few different places, and that's just as good as having a bunch of different hash functions. Is everyone willing to believe that? So I have just a utility function that does just that. It um, creates a Bloom filter. So we're creating a Bloom filter with 1,024 uh, buckets. And we're creating uh, three 32-bit hash functions uh, from a larger hash function. And then just as you would expect, if you insert something into the Bloom filter and you look it up, it's there, right? Um, if you look something up that uh, isn't there, well, in this case, we don't have three false positives for this key, so it's not there. Right? Um, so if we want to look at how the false positive rate changes over time, 
we can set up a simple experiment. This is one of the cool things about these notebook environments is that you can sort of track false positives over time and see, see what they wind up looking like. So I'm going to collect the false positive rate every 100 samples, and I'm just going to put a bunch of random bits into this thing, assuming that I'm not going to have too many collisions in the random bits, so that if I haven't, if I get 64 random bits, I'm probably not going to get the same 64 random bits twice in the amount of time I have to run this experiment. If I am, I need a new source of randomness. Um, and so if I find the bits that I'm generating in the Bloom filter, then I'm going to assume it's a false positive, because I'm going to assume that these 64 random bits are something I haven't, gen I'm not going to generate twice in, in the uh, course of this experiment. So I'm just going to do some stuff here in these cells to set up plotting, and I'm going to run this experiment. And then we can see how the false positive rate increases as the number of unique values increases. So I'm creating a bloom filter with 4,096 buckets in this case, and I'm doing uh, 2 to the 18th uh, values, inserting 2 to the 18th values into it. And this will take a minute to run on, on the shared infrastructure and probably also a minute to download over my cell phone. Um, but we can see that that false positive rate, as, as we talked about earlier, gradually climbs towards 1, right? Where eventually you're just seeing everything as already in your bloom filter. And so as the number of unique values increases, uh, we have sort of a log scale here. Um, we get uh, get an increasingly worse false positive rate. If we increase the size of the filter, we get better results. So let's run a different experiment with a much larger bloom filter, four times as many buckets. So while that's running, I'll just point out that we actually have a formula where we can estimate an expected false positive rate for a bloom filter based on the number of hash functions we have, the size of the filter, and the number of things we expect to put into it. So as you see, that false positive rate is much better, uh, especially considering that here the, the knee and the curve is around 10 to the third. Here it's around uh, 10 to the close, much closer to 10 to the fourth. So uh, we, can, we can sort of calculate our false positive rate with this formula that I'm explaining in this paragraph. I don't want to dive deep into this. I just want to say that this is something you can do. If that formula doesn't make a lot of sense to you, which it doesn't intuitively tell me what to expect, you can plot it, right? So that's, that's what I'll do here is I'll plot what this looks like um, for a given set of... Uh, for the, for the same filter size that I was looking at earlier. And as we can see, our expectation of the false positive rate winds up looking a lot like the actual one we got by running the experiment. So that's, that's sort of cool. Um, so here we just sort of showed the intersection and the union of the Bloom filter. We have a more involved <laughs> implementation and the only thing we're doing is we're adding these intersection, which is just taking the intersection of the bit vectors, and the union, which is just sort of taking the union of the bit vectors, so that we can run these in parallel. And I think uh, in the interest of getting to some of these other structures, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time diving deep into those, but let's uh, move on with the rest of the the notebook here, and we can see the example from the slides that if we take the intersection of these two, um, we find that something that's in one of them is in the intersection. Uh, something that's in both of them is in the intersection, rather. Um, and similarly with the union. So I talked about how the intersection of multiple bloom filters can have a higher false positive rate than the bloom filter of the intersection. And some of the applications you see for bloom filters, especially if you're implementing one of these in hardware to support microarchitectural features, um, you really want to have a low <laughs> false positive rate. 
So the partitioned Bloom filter is sort of an interesting ex extension where you have one set of buckets for each hash function. So it's not just that you have a hash collision between any pair of hash functions. It's that you have a hash collision for the same hash function. Does it make sense? So we can see what that looks like, but I don't want to dive into it too much because it's sort of the basis for the next structure that Eric's going to talk about. But the partition bloom filter has much better performance under intersection. And I guess I didn't run this cell before running the cell before running the cell after it. And we can see if we look at the false positive rate under intersection that of this uh, example here, the bloom filter is going to have a worse one than the partition bloom filter. And there's also this cool property that if any of the any of the sets of buckets is empty, then you know that the two sets don't intersect at all. Right, which is something you can't get from the intersection of regular bloom filters. So again, with the partition bloom filter, you have one set of buckets for each hash function. And we see here that um, the false positive rate is much better, in fact, for the partition bloom with the. Okay. And we also see that the access here is labeled in an unfortunate way. So there are some, uh, there are some applications. Obviously, the, the, the hyphenation case study that we discussed, uh, there's an application in databases uh, talking about some applications in uh, exposing parallelism in hardware. This is a really cool data structure. It's incremental, scalable, and parallel. It's very simple. We have a reasonable implementation in like a screen of Python code, not counting this bit vector that we're, we're delegating to. And uh, finally, it's, it's something that sort of introduces this technique of hashing so that we can have a constant space approximation for an arbitrarily large set of things. So Eric is going to present now a generalization of the Bloom filter for a different application. Let's see if I can get the mic working. that's close enough. Um, so yeah, we're going to take a look at, uh, instead of just set membership, um, we're actually going to look at uh, like object frequencies uh, next. So suppose you wanted to like identify something like trending topics, like what are the most popular hashtags currently coming over Twitter or Instagram? Um, you know, say you're categorizing uh, infrastructure log messages um, from a data center, um, which subsystems return the most errors. Um, for these kinds of problems, uh, calculating an exact answer could actually be prohibitive for a lot of the same reasons that we'll just describe for the bloom filter. Uh, the actual number of unique objects you're trying to keep track of is much too large. Um, but again, if we're willing to tolerate, you know, um, getting approximate answers, it turns out we can uh, get a useful answer in bound, bounded space with a different kind of sketch. Um, and as like Will did before, we're going to first sort of describe and then reject some precise data structures. Um, you know, if you just have a few elements, you can do something very, very similar to what Will did, just store, you know, the objects with their counts directly in an array. Obviously, that's not going to scale past a few things. Um, you know, with a tree structure that stores these ordered pairs, you can obviously scale farther, but you're never going to scale past you know your available RAM on your machine. Um, and you can see that these look very, very similar um, to the structure for set membership, except that um, we're looking at counts of things instead of, you know, just a bit. Um, or we can invert that and say it's like the bloom filter is actually just like this, except you have, uh, you know, one bit numbers. So the next structure I'm going to talk about is called the count min sketch. 
and uh, it just generalizes the bloom filter to hold counts instead of bits. Um, so here is a diagram of a uh, partitioned um, bloom filter, except those are not really single bits anymore. Um, and if we insert something into the sketch, we hash it with several functions. And for each one, we're incrementing the counter. So the first time you see these things, it kind of looks like the bloom filter. Um, now, suppose you have, you know, a structure is populated with many counts. Now you can actually see they're not just bits, they're integers. Um, and we use the hash function to find each of the buckets. Um, and we take the minimum. And um, again, if you imagine that those are, you know, single bit numbers, um, we are taking the minimum uh, with the bloom filter as well. It's just what we usually call that, uh, you know, bitwise and. So. Um, what's that? Oh, okay. Um, the main. I'm not going to talk about this. The main thing is again, you can see you can do this in a single slide of code, so it's pretty simple to implement. But yeah, we we'll see that going on in a notebook. Um, so, like the Bloom filter, you can you know define a merge operator, um, the analog of like addition, and get yourself you know a combined result. And in this case, you combine them um, simply by summing. Um, instead of oring. Another trick you can do is um, you can take the inner product of these two things. Um, and so you do this, you just sum the result of multiplying um, in you know the individual buckets. So you can imagine it's being very much like the vector inner product. Like it wants me to. I can step through this if you want to explain what this is useful for. Um, okay, so Will's going to be my meta animator here. Um, and so what this gives you is an estimate of how many things um, were in both tables. And well, you know, what that's good for is suppose you have. You know, you're looking at log messages, and you're actually hashing on the individual words you saw in your log messages. Um, you know, you can basically say, if one of these is like only keeping track of subsystem, and the other one's keeping track of purely severity strings, um, if I want to know how many things were like actual system errors and etcd, um, you know, that dot product gives me the estimate of that. In this case, it's said I found seven log messages that were, you know, error severity in uh, the etcd subsystem. Uh, so another thing you can do with these things is keep track of the top k elements. Um, so like the top five, the top 10. Um, and, and again, you can imagine, you know, doing trending topics on social media to do this. Um, so how do you get this? Um, you take one of these count min sketches and combine it with a priority queue. Um, so you insert an element into the sketch. Um, you get its frequency. In this case, its estimate would be 20. Um, and you get that value, and you insert it into the queue. And of course, priority queues are basically good at keeping track of the top k of values, and so you can just keep doing this until you fill up your queue. Possibly not. Oh, there it goes. And so now you can see that, uh, you know, you have the top, uh, you have the top five uh, keywords. Um, so, you know, Twitter alone gets like a half a billion tweets a day. Um, and you can imagine you're never going to be able to keep track of all the unique hashtags. And so, you know, if you combine the count min sketch to give you the, uh, you know, sketched um, frequencies, 
and with the priority queue, what you get, of course, is a top K list. Now, these are, of course, going to be estimates, those 1.84 million. It's not an exact count because we saw that, you know, basically it's going to overestimate uh, counts in some cases. But it also, you know, once you're into the millions, you know, who cares? It just doesn't matter. So, um, it, you know, this is a great application for uh, using a count min to get your top K. Um, you can get even more complicated. You could trop, track trending topics so that you drill down by geographic region. Um, you can actually, uh, you know, categorize by day of the week and combine them. Like to say, you know, what's the trending topics for the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. Um, So in a similar vein, suppose you were uh, running like a video streaming site, maybe your Netflix. Um, you're interested in like the most popular videos based on views of a geographic region. Um, you know, you can say build a count min sketch in a top K structure for each of the uh, 35 countries in that hemisphere. And um, you can take the union of all of them or part of them to build up the, uh, you know, exact count of the geographic region that you want. Um, so obviously, you know, even the Americas are not culturally monolithic, and so you could ask whether videos that are popular in Boston are also popular in Tulsa, um, or videos that are popular, you know, among Francophones in Quebec uh, are popular among the Lusophones in Sao Paulo. Um, and you can get the approximate answers to all of these kinds of queries using the inner product trick we just described. Um, you can even, you know, ask questions like, you know, well, what's the effect of seasons on video popularity? So, like, you, you know, is a video that's popular in the northern hemisphere during the summer also popular in the southern hemisphere in the winter? Um, so, we can go to the notebook. Um, Will is helpfully doing driving for me here because it's his laptop. So we go to the count in sketch and click on that. <laughs> and wait for my phone. <laughs> that was pretty fast. So again, um, I'm not going to go over this because we've basically uh, this already, but it's good context for the notebook. Um, so we're going to do some imports, you know, the usual numeric packages. Um, now here, you've actually defined the, uh, here you've actually defined it, and again, you can see there's some bookkeeping stuff for the object, but um, as you saw in that little slide, here, the main lookup, lookup and merge and insert fit on a single page. Um, and a lot of that is actually comments. So we'll define that. Um, here we'll just uh, declare account min sketch. And, you know, if we try to look up something in an empty account min sketch, you get a zero. Um, that's an appealing property. And um, if you insert it, and you look it up, you get a single uh, frequency answer, also good. Um, <coughs> what do we have here? So hash collisions in count min sketches can lead to overestimating I mean, counts, not just basically being over enthusiastic about set membership. So um, we're going to design a function very much like the one that um, Will ran in the previous notebook to see how um, this distortion can uh, grow over time. So, shift return and declare a, uh, a notebook parameterization. We'll see how good it runs. And Again, you can see there's like kind of a, 
a knee in the curve. Um, can you remind me what this axis is? Is this like percent error? Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and so, you know, the actual error is like not bad, um, but after a while you start overestimating by quite a bit. Um, Oh, 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 okay. Sorry, what does this chart say? So if we, if we scroll up a few cells, it explains what's going on there. The cumulative distribution of the factors that we've overestimated accounts by. Uh, So, oh, I see, I think. So of all the things that you have in the I get it. sketch, all of them are overestimated by a factor of less than 40? So the yeah. factor is on the, on the vertical x, right? Yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, so actually the error is yeah, the x-axis. So like out here you say I overestimated the count by a factor of 10, so it's like kind of a lot actually. Um, but because uh, it wasn't a very large table and we gave it a lot of data. and. You know, so like, again, the knee of the curve maybe is like here. This is the cumulative distribution, so the probability that I actually, you know, all of, basically everything was less than or equal to 40, and, you know, half of this stuff was less than or equal to a factor of five, basically. Um, okay, so on the uh, vertical x, it's the probability of being overestimated, right? It's the By fraction. The no, it's actually, it's, it's actually, it's actually the fraction, um, it's actually the fraction of um, values we saw that were, you know, estimated by, overestimated by less than or equal to some things. So we can see that like 90% of them were estimated by less than a factor of 10. Um, and, you know, over half are overestimated by less than a factor of 3. So oh, look at that. Yeah. Um, So, you know, whether or not a factor of three is like a real problem, you know, is of course domain dependent, but generally you might want to declare a larger table because you don't um, actually want to overestimate by that much. Um, so here we're going to declare a larger table and see if we can fix that. Um, you can see that, uh, you know, the x-axis has changed substantially. So now, you know, 90% of things are, le you know, overestimated by less than a factor of five, and I bet he annotated it already. Maybe not, but, um, you know, half of them. <laughs> Dramatically. It's, it's better. Um, and you can make a larger table, obviously, and make this as good as you want. Again, as Will discussed earlier, you pick the trade-offs. Um, So there's a section here of exercises you can try uh, on your own time. Um, here's a slightly larger table. Uh, again, you just basically showing you can keep making this better and better as your needs require. Um, so some ideas, um, as we've talked about, this count min sketch is a biased estimator. Um, you could experiment with techniques to adjust the estimates and try and correct the bias. And there are papers written about this online um, where you can try to come up with your own. Um, you know, when you pair it with a priority queue, the count min sketch can be used to track the top K, uh, as we described. So you could actually try getting a, you know, priority queue package or implement your own and um, augment this to uh, give yourself a top K notebook. Um, and then there's, uh, you know, clever problem-solving puzzles, you know, could you handle uh, negative values when you're inserting? Um, and, you know, how could you use minimum, uh, you know, sort of like in the same way that uh, the Bloom filter uses uh, actual site intersection? And with that, we will move on to the next sketch.
All right, so this is the problem of counting distinct items. So this is where you have a set that's so large that you can't keep the set around, and you want to know how many things are in it. <laughs> right. So if you wanted to just count a multi-set, that's really easy, right? Just start keeping an integer, and it's very large. But if you want to count the number of distinct things, that's, that's a little more interesting. So again, precise approaches maintain an explicit data structure and see how big it is. But these don't do us a lot of good when we have to do with something that's deal with something that's too big to have an explicit data structure. You can actually estimate cardinality with the bloom filter. I'm just going to tell you that this is possible. I'm going to show you this code and I'm going to tell you that you can search the internet for a paper by Swamidas and Baldi from 2007 if you care. I don't think you should care because we're about to learn a better technique. But it is sort of one of the other ways that the Bloom filter is a cool data structure that punches above its weight. You can use it for almost anything. The technique I'm going to talk about is called hyperloglog. -log. And this is, um, we're going to focus on the intuition behind hyperloglog -log because the intuitions are a little less obvious than they are for the first two, right? It's easy to think about hashing, it's easy to think about the minimum, it's easy to think about hash collisions, or at least it's sort of easy. Right? But my hope is that after we look at this part of the talk and the, and the notebook for hyperloglog, -log, we'll have a better idea of how it's working. It's a very cool technique. So let's say you flip a fair coin. Right? Lands with the reverse facing up. What do we call this side of the coin in check? Face. The face? This is the face. Like, uh, Paula. Paula. So say it lands, it lands with Paula up. Pa? Palan? Pana. Pana, okay. <laughs> this is this is this is ten crowns. It has a picture of Bruno on it. Come on, guys. <laughs> okay. Okay, it's not surprising, right? We 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 get we get this we get that we get the picture of Bruno. <laughs> We're not surprised. We get four of them in a row. Are we surprised yet? Maybe surprised but not shocked, right? You got a one in sixteen chance. We get sixty-four in a row. I'm reaching for my wallet at this point, right? <laughs> like it's not a fair coin. Right, it's extremely unlikely. It's, it's a one in eighteen quintillion chance of getting this result. Right. So, what do coin flips have to do with set cardinality? Well, we can think of a sequence of coin flips as a binary number. Right. So, let's say we have a source for uniformly distributed n-bit numbers. Each of the bits in these numbers is like a coin flip. These bits are all independent because the numbers are uniformly distributed. Each one is independent of every other. It's equally likely to be one or zero. So the probability of seeing an arbitrary uniformly distributed n-bit number that begins with n zeros is one in two to the n. Just like the probability of getting n panas that's not the right plural, I'm sorry, <laughs> in a row. <laughs> um, we can estimate that if we see a number with n zeros at the beginning, that we're likely to have seen 2 to the n numbers overall. And the reason why this is the case Let's go to another cumulative distribution, shall we? Have we had enough cumulative distributions today? I don't think we have. We definitely have not had enough cumulative distributions. If you've had enough cumulative distributions, you're in for disappointment. Um, so every time, if you think about the space of all possible numbers, right? every time you add another 0 to the beginning of one of those binary numbers, you're cutting the number of things you have left in half. right? Because you have two options. You can be either 0 or 1. 
every time you do 0 instead of 1, you're cutting that. Every time you do 0 instead of 0 or 1, you're cutting in half, right? So if we look at, if we look at these sort of uniformly distributed numbers, and we look at the cumulative distribution of ones that have a certain number of leading zeros, we see that every time we add another leading zero, we cut the number of things we have in half, right? the number of things that are left in half. So we have a technique, actually, for estimating the number of distinct, uniformly distributed random numbers that we've seen by counting the largest number of leading zeros. Cool story, bro, right? Yeah. <laughs> what is it good for? We, we, like, do you want to count number? I mean, like, the next time I'm at a party and I want to like impress a crowd, I'm going to say, well, how many numbers do you think you've seen if, if you get this one? Huh? Huh? No, counting numbers is not that interesting, right? We want to count IP addresses. We want to count unique search queries. We want to count arbitrary objects. We want to count anything. <sighs> if only we had a way to convert arbitrary objects into uniformly distributed random numbers. Hmm? <laughs> if we had a function that would map <laughs> from arbitrary objects to uniformly distributed numbers, then we could do this, right? Can we think of such a function? A hash, yeah, we have hashes, right? If a hash is good, changing any bit of the input is equally likely to change any bit of the output. If a hash is good, the bits are gonna be independent. So we can hash arbitrary objects and turn them in to n bit numbers and then estimate how many things we've seen by keeping track of how many leading zeros we've seen. The only way that it's true. I mean, or to wait until 3.20 when this talk is, but that's the end of the conference. We can stay here as long as we want. Um, so the problem, with, the problem with doing this, just like we talked about, though, is if you count the zeros, you have an extremely high variance, right? Because every time you have one of those elite, additional leading zeros, you're doubling your estimated count, right? So you don't want to have a technique for estimating the counts of multisets that only gives you power, or the counts of distinct elements in a set that only gives you powers of two, right? You don't, <laughs> it's, it's not, not a good result, right? So we can use a technique to smooth out that high variance. And the technique that we're gonna use is we're gonna take, we're gonna take a bunch of these and we're gonna, we're gonna average them out. Now, because each of these is a rate, um, we're not gonna use an arithmetic mean, but we'll get to that in a second. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the first few bits <coughs> of the hash value for our arbitrary object, and I'm going to use those to select one of a set of counters. And then I'm going to take the number of leading zeros from the second half, and I'm going to update that counter. And I'm going to keep track of the maximum number of leading zeros I've seen. So now I've seen one thing. I've updated one counter with two leading zeros. As this goes on, I'm going to update more and more things. Here I have zero leading zeros, so I don't update it at all. And ultimately, I'm going to have some structure that looks maybe more like this, right? What I'm going to do is take the harmonic mean of two to the power of each of these counts, instead of just taking two to the power of one of these counts, which is only going to give me estimates that are powers of two, and I'm going to get the answer roughly 16. And the quick one sentence reason why we do a harmonic mean is that we're essentially talking about rates here. And the harmonic mean is appropriate for averaging rates. Right? If you see someone who's uh, advertising um, something to make your programs run faster and they give you the arithmetic mean of the speed ups they offer, you should, you should check to make sure that your coin is not landing with the picture of Bruno on the top every time reach for your wallet. Okay, so the cool thing about these sketches is we can combine them just as we did with the count min sketch or with the bloom filter by taking the maximum of each bucket. And these are also very, uh, very straightforward to code. 
And I think, actually, I just sort of want to go back to the notebook. How do we feel about that? Yes. All right. So we'll go back to the home, and we'll click O3 hyperloglog. Log. And you can actually see what the code looks like. Um, I'm just going to say run all cells so that I can uh, sort of talk about this. Um, basically, the hardest part of this code is doing bit manipulation in Python and counting the number of leading zeros. <laughs> right? Beyond that, it's pretty simple. Um, so I'm going to, again, if I look at the number of leading zeros in a uh, set of 32-bit random integers, I can see that nearly all of them have fewer than 12 leading zeros. Uh, I only got 4,096 numbers there. Um, I'm going to, again, use some, use some tricks to do, get some hashes. But the actual hyperloglog log code itself is pretty simple. I have this collection of registers, which is just these counters of how many, um, how many bits I've seen, how many zeros I've seen, leading zeros I've seen. Um, and then I have a way to sort of combine these counts from each register with the harmonic mean, which I'm importing someone else's implementation from. Right? So. so I create one of these. I put 20,000 random 64-bit integers in it. I'm hoping that, again, that my source of randomness is not giving me the same thing in these. And my estimate is, is 24,000, which is not awesome, but it's, it's not bad either, right? The cool thing about this technique is that if I gave it way more than this, which we're not going to sit around and, and wait for it to do because it's running in Python on someone else's computer, um, we would get a result that was, that was closer as well. And we can see how we can add these together. Um, the, the exercise to try at home is to, to do this yourself and, and sort of convince yourself, make an intuitive argument that it works the same way. Um, a really, a thing that I would really recommend trying we can actually see this again. So we get a better count the next time. We could try 200,000. Let that run. Ah, that's, that's quite an overestimate. But anyway, um, you can read this paper, uh, Hyperloglog Log in Practice, which sort of details how Google took this algorithm and used it to be made, changed it, tuned it to be really useful um, for the kinds of these problems, these, uh, cardinality problems that they have at scale. All right, so I have one more thing that I want to just sort of touch on, and then I'm going to hand it over to Eric to talk about the T-Digest, which is a really cool data structure for estimating approximate cumulative distributions. So again, yeah, I'm sorry, cumulative distributions. <laughs> We can, tell, we can tell who the uh, cumulative distribution super fans are because we're, we're still here. So. so just briefly, let's look at this, this problem called uh, of set similarity. Um, and I want to motivate this with a particular application area. And that's um, looking at simul similar documents. Um, I, taught, uh, I taught undergraduate computer science uh, quite a bit um, in a past life, and one of the real frustrations with teaching undergraduate programming is you have to come up with a new project every semester to stop people from rampantly cheating on your assignments. Right? So um, pla plagiarism is a big problem. Plagiarism is a big problem in the humanities as well. Students, you know, cut and I mean, sometimes it's that students don't attribute properly. Sometimes it's that they just cut and paste and represent someone else's work as their own because on purpose. But um, let's say that you're someone whose job it is to evaluate natural language prose, and you want to you wanna say whether or not uh, something is uncannily familiar to something else. Yeah, Christoph. Before we go into that stuff, might it be that these hyperbinder things like, disappear again after some time? The, the binder d should disappear after some period of inactivity. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, like an hour, I think you have. It's a, it's a lease, basically. Because we have the title in our notebooks, we were just listening. Oh. It 
it's necessary to go to the original URL again. If you go to the original URL again, yeah. There is also a GitHub repo, yeah. You could run locally if you want. That's a good question, and I should have called that out, I guess. So let's say that you're a literary agent, and you get a new manuscript that starts with this catchy uh, pair of sentences. Um, but you know, it's, it's a little clunky. You think you may have seen it somewhere before. I don't know, does this look familiar to anyone? Yeah, so this, is, this, is, um, this should look familiar because it's a lightly edited copy of the first two sentences of Pride and Prejudice. Uh, we, we, we Americanized it just because you know, it's our prerogative. Uh, but if you didn't, didn't already add that you there, um, but if you didn't already know that, you'd have a hard time figuring it out, right? And plagiarism detection is, is super interesting both in human language and in programming languages, but there are a lot of other interesting problems that are related, like if we wanted to say which of these news articles are similar, which of these news articles are talking about this, which of these are the same, right? Which of these are just republished wire service articles from the same source? Which of these, uh, you know, just sort of if you want to group results together in a search query. So if we wanted to solve this problem precisely, well, we could certainly represent documents as sets of words, and then we could take the, what's called the Jacquard index, of two sets, and the Jacquard index is just a measure of set similarity. And this is very simple. Basically, we take the size of the intersection, which is not going to be particularly legible on this uh, projector, and the size of the union, and we, we take, the, take the ratio of these two, and we say it's basically the, the size of the intersection divided by the size of the union, so you get, uh, in this case, there's, there, these are two are uh, three-tenths uh, similar, for example. Um, so they're not particularly similar. But we could use this with sets of words. We could use this with sets of substrings. We could use this with uh, you know, any number of techniques to find similar documents. The problem is that even though this technique is very easy, maintaining those explicit set representations is very expensive. Right? I don't want to keep a document around and also an explicit set of all the things in that document. And I certainly don't want to do this fast linear time operation for every pair of documents I might ever care about. Right. Um, if I wanted to do a linear time algorithm on all the set of the set of all five character substrings in a large document, that adds up, right? And if I have ten million documents, I'd have to calculate and sort fifty trillion Jacquard indices in order to find the most similar documents. So I don't want to deal with that. No one wants to deal with that. So let's go to the notebook and see how this minhash technique works very quickly. It solves sort of both sides of the problem. So we'll go home again and we'll go to minhash. And again, this is just sort of a quick flavor of this. We want to want to turn it over and talk about the t-digest um, pretty quickly here. So. Basically, the idea is that you solve the Jacquard index, the problem that the Jacquard index takes linear time by calculating a signature of a set. So that the signatures are very cheap to compare. And you solve the problem of doing all of the pairwise comparisons by using a technique called locality sensitive hashing so that you have a way to filter down and only compare a subset of all the documents that are most likely to be relevant. So I actually really want to turn this over to Eric so we can talk about the T-Digest. But I would say if you're interested in this technique, this notebook sort of has a quick implementation both of the minhash technique itself. Again, very simple, fits on mostly on a single slide, not exactly in 80 characters. Um, how we can test it to see how well the implementation works, and then um, use locality sensitive hashing so that we don't have to do pairwise comparisons, solving sort of both sides of the scalability problem with set similarity. And then um, there's a link to a free online book chapter where you can learn almost anything you would want to know about this technique. Is it cool if we, if we defer to more cumulative distributions now? All right. Excellent. Thank you so much. Oh, 
I need to get out of. Someday I'll stop being confounded by full screen mode. All right. So this thing is playing. Why is it playing? question you could ask is, uh, you know, we talked about sort of in individual applications of sketches today, you know, overall it's like you might say why sketching, you know, data science dog here is also curious. So, you know, as we've seen, you can basically create a representation of your data that is much, much smaller. Um, it's also much, much faster to manipulate and um, faster to <laughs> accumulate them. Um, and at the same time, it preserves all the essential features of your data, um, or what's, a, what's essential to you know, the application you have at hand. Um, and I, hope so, I also hope that uh, maybe you come away with uh, an intuition that um, we're, all, we're all data sketchers. You know, um, as Will talked about, if you've ever taken the mean and variance of some data, you've done data sketching. Um, if you uh, cluster your data, the cluster centers are a sketch of you know the data that you have, and um, even if you do uh, machine learning, um, <coughs> there's even a theorem: uh, learning is a kind of data compression. Um, and so, if you train a learning model, you're actually um, essentially sketching um, the data that was in your uh, feature vectors and training samples. Um, so, data sketching is really all around us. Um, so uh, the last uh, sketch we're going to talk about is called the T Digest. Uh, it was introduced by uh, Ted Dunning and Omar Ertl, um, and that's the title of the paper up there. If you want to look it up, it's actually it lives on a GitHub repo. Um, it's got implementations in a whole bunch of popular languages, um, and, and now Scala, um, which I did. And um, there's also libraries that integrate. Um, these things with uh, Spark and PySpark, so you can use uh, user-defined aggregators uh, in Spark and do these uh, sketches. So what exactly is the thing sketching? Um, if you have a stream of numbers coming from somewhere, um, any kind of numbers, it's going to give you an estimate of the cumulative distribution function um, of the data that it saw. So this, this little chapter is going to be all about estimate, estimating uh, cumulative distributions and things you might be able to do with that. Uh, so what is a cumulative distribution or a CDF? Um, you know, if you have data with some kind of density, um, which is, of course, the probability density function, just usually f of x, um, a cumulative distribution is basically a measure of you know, the probability that's to the left of that. So in this case, that black dot is basically a representation of this area, little tail back there. Um, and because it's always the measure of something that's to the left of it, it's monotonically increasing. So as you see, if you, if you move x to the right over the distribution of your data, this number, the area just keeps going up and up. And eventually you get to one, and after that nothing changes because that just encompasses everything. So those of you who are like savvy might be asking, it's like, well, if that's nice that I have an estimate of my cumulative distribution function, but like, what if I actually want an estimate of the density of my data? Um, you know, what can I do with that? Um, so it turns out that this is actually coming right off the fundamental theorem of calculus. 
I know you all remember that. Um, but if you have the cumulative distribution function and you take its gradient, you get back the density. Uh, so it turns out that even if you just have a sketch of you, your CDF, you also have a way to get the, the density function. And in the packages I published, I provide ways you can actually do that. Um, so what are some properties of this? So I'm like, most of these sketches we've all seen, it has a way to do incremental updates as it sees new data. Um, you know, you have a new data comes in and you get an updated t-digest that represents, you know, having seen that piece of data. So why does that help? You know, again, most of these applications are designed to work with very, very large data or streaming data coming at you like a weasel on meth. Um, and you can take that and maintain a compact running sketch of it um, in essentially, you know, compact space and time. Um, so what's the payoff of that? I mean, let's just imagine you've got like a REST service um, running, you know, these days in Kubernetes or OpenShift. Um, and you're measuring query latencies, you know, so your users are like hitting your system and you interested in like knowing like well what kind of query latencies they're experiencing and of course if you're somebody like Netflix you know you're getting like a massive stream that basically never ends of you know queries and a corresponding set of latencies and so um, you might be interested in like the distribution so suppose you take a sketch and you get your CDF what kind of questions can you actually answer about your data um, you can do a descriptive thing you say what does my latency distribution look like um, what's the shape of this data? Um, you can ask, like, you know, service level agreement questions. Um, you can say, hey, are 90% of my latencies under one second? Um, or whatever, you know, whatever is considered uh, what you want to provide for your users. Um, interestingly enough, you might also want to simulate latencies. Um, and I'll show you how you can do clever things with uh, these sketches to actually not just describe your data, but uh, simulate data with the same distribution randomly. Um, so what's some other payoff? You know, back in the day, of course, data just was like a monolithic thing that lived um, you know, on your system, and data was small, and it was basically easy. It was very easy to like take that data and generate a sketch. Um, but these days, of course, you we have very large data sets. They reside across many systems. Here you can see a cluster kube running on Apple IIEs. Um, and, you know, it's easy enough to see how you can take a sketch of the cumulative distribution for each of your partitions. But, the, you know, now you've got a bunch of these things. What can you do? Can you merge them like we merged all these other things? Uh, so to answer that question, I've got to tell a different story. Um, so how do these things actually represent um, a sketch of a distribution? Um, and under the hood, all it is is a list of clusters. And clusters have a location, you know, like basically in, in the space of the numbers you're representing, <laughs> and a mass that basically represents kind of like locally how much data landed near that cluster. Um, so you'll see me use X and M as like annotation for that. And you know, you can see that, you know, it represents these things where you have like, you know, the where the slope is, you know, small, like off on the tails, you have, you know, smaller clusters and they may be farther apart when, you know, in the bulk, you know, near the mode of your distribution where things are denser, you've got more clusters and they're larger. Um, and so that's really all the intuition you need. Um, so when you picture this thing, just think of like a, just think of an object that's maintaining a list of these clusters that are just nothing but number slash mass frequency pairs. Um, so you know, large mass, steep slope. So let's go back to this question. Um, you know, <coughs> you have data living in some partitions. You can sketch your data, and what you've actually got is a bunch of these clusters. And so, um, you know, the way you merge them is you can simply take them and run the update logic for each of the clusters 
into another one and I'm massively waving my hands at how this works because we deliberately decided ahead of time that we didn't have time to talk too much about it but um, if you're curious about the real details of how this logic works um, there's code in the notebook you can study um, I'll warn you ahead of time um, I think there are some bugs still living in that code that's in the notebook so you gotta sort of take it poetically um, I also gave two talks one last summer in Boston um, and a similar one uh, at Spark Summit um, a year or two ago um, where I do nothing but talk about the T-Digest and so if that's something you'd like to drill down on um, I encourage you to check out those talks I can tell you more about them offline or you can just Google my name and T-Digest and you'll probably find it um, the main point is like all these other sketches, you can merge them, and so it gives you scale-out parallelism. Um, and I will talk about one last clever thing you can do. Um, there's a trick you can do with any cumulative distribution function. It's called inverse transform sampling, which is a fancy-sounding thing for something that's not that hard. Um, the range of any CDF is, of course, from 0 to 1, because it's just basically summing up the cumulative probabilities. And never less than zero and never greater than one. Um, so on the y-axis, you can basically take a uniform distribution sampling between zero and one, that orange dot there, landed somewhere. And on the curve, you can find the value of x um, that corresponded to that point. So this is basically why it's called inverse transform sampling. You're taking the function inverse. Um, and so that value is equivalent to a value randomly drawn from the actual distribution. So as long as you can generate uniformly distributed numbers, and basically, of course, you can do that easily on all systems these days, you can actually simulate the distribution of your data using this trick. Um, and again, the packages that I provided to give you this ability, you don't have to figure out how to do it yourself. So the main point is, these models are not just descriptive, they can be used generatively. Um, and that's can be a very powerful thing. Um, I gave another talk about like what you can do with that. But, uh, so we have ways basically to sketch data, and then now we can basically turn the crank in the reverse direction and um, simulate our data with our sketch. And that was, I believe, yes, all I wanted to talk about there. We'll just dive right to the notebook. We have 10 minutes. I can do it. Um, yeah. So, so if you look at um, health data of human beings, right? Maybe um, we found that in facial vectors. Can we use that stuff to generate artificial patients? Um, you can. Um, with the caveat that Generally speaking, they can only generate the marginal distributions. Um, so you cannot you cannot use this to simulate the joint distribution of your n-dimensional vector, but you can easily easily simulate all the marginals because you can ju generate a sketch for every single feature column and then simulate. Um, So we'll just, uh, I could actually run. Maybe I'll do his thing because we're running out of time. I'll do the thing where we just run everybody. As with all of them, we got basically an implementation of T-Digest that's right inside the notebook. Um, like I said, I do believe that there are uh, some bugs in this. Um, but it'll give you, it'll definitely give you the idea of what's going on. Um, 
One thing about this, this data structure is it's slightly less simple than the ones we showed before. Uh, if there's a less appealing property about this, actually getting all the bookkeeping details right is a little trickier. So um, of all these, this is probably the toughest one to actually get working on your own. Um, so let's look at visualizing. Um, I define a little function for, it just basically plots um, the CDF using a t-digest. Um, oh, somewhere up here I actually took the sketch. Where is that? Uh-oh. Did I break it? You may have closed the window. Oh. Starting over. Um. see by the amount of scrolling I have to do, it's not the most compact implementation. And yet it can fit in a notebook, so it's not thousands of lines of code. Um, so here we declare, okay, here we are. So we're you know, doing the same thing we usually do. We take a t-digest. Uh, you can set the compression on these things. Um, so you can, again, this is how you trade size versus fidelity in these sketches. Um, and then I simulate the gamma distribution uh, with 100,000 samples. Um, you know, I use gamma because it has a shape that looks sort of like this kind of shape you get if you're measuring query latencies and stuff like that. So first visualizing, this is just a thing I can use to plot the cumulative distribution. So here's my, here's my CDF. Um, and you can see that if you sort of like run, you know, the median, about 50% of these things are, you know, seven or less seconds, let's say. Um, that's really not a spectacular performance from a query latency perspective, but um, you get the idea. Um, all of them are basically less than or equal to 25. Um, so, and you can get quantiles, right? So. Here, I'm actually getting the number. It's like, what's the median or the 0.5 quantile? It's about seven and a half. The 90th percentile is around 11. And if I want to look at what everything is, it's pretty close to almost everything is less than or equal to 20. Um, and again, here's inverse transform sampling. Um, I just take the uniform thing and I take then the inverse of the CDF of that value. Um, in this case, I wrote it so it returns a bunch of stuff, so I asked for 10 of these things. So here's 10 samples that are simulated from the sketch. Um, and so if I did this, how well does it actually work? Um, I'm going to use this. I'm going to generate a large sample size. Um, and I'll take the, I'll plot the, uh, you know, sketch of the uh, synthesized data. And you can see it looks exactly like the uh, data that uh, we actually, you know, the real data. So it's actually a very good simulation. Um, and that was all I wanted to talk about. And we have five minutes. So I, I'd like to echo and emphasize something Eric just pointed out, though, which is that like, if you have a phenomenon that you can observe that generates a single metric every time you can observe it, you can use this to faithfully simulate something that looks like that phenomenon, not to put too fine a point on it. Like, that's really cool. Yes, and you can do clever things. Like, um, you know, if you've ever tried to uh, do random forest clustering, one of the things you do for random forest clustering is take your feature columns and randomize them. And when Leo Brayman first did this, he was working with data that fitted in RAM. And so it's easy to randomize stuff that's in RAM. But once you start scaling out, how do you do that? Um, it's all but impossible. But <clears throat> if you do what I told you, it's like if you sketch each of your columns and then start drawing random numbers from them, it's like turns out that you can scalably, you know, get exactly the same behavior. It's like you basically got stuff which is completely uncorrelated but shares all the marginals, which is exactly what you're doing for random force clustering. So it turns out this is a technique for, you know, doing true scale out. Um, random forest clustering, which isn't as popular as it used to be, but 
you can do cool stuff with this. I think most people care about quantiles. But you can also do anomaly detection. Um, you know, if you start seeing, you can like test your data. If you can basically sketch the distribution and you start testing it, <clears throat> you know, if you start seeing a whole lot of uh, values that are like showing up with, you know, oh, I'm getting like you know 0 0.999 um, many times in a row. It's kind of like Will B's fair coin flip, right? It's like that's suspicious. <laughs> you shouldn't you shouldn't be seeing tons and tons of data that's way out on the extremes or way down here. So it's also basically a nice tool for doing, um, you know, quick and dirty anomaly detection generators. Mm. Yes? On, on data that fits in RAM, how does it compare to like ordinary complexity estimates or something? Um, so you're saying, oh, I get by. For data sets where I can afford, let's say, a traditional approach? Um, I think it's actually it compares pretty favorably. Um, it's still smaller, and um, you know because it does the because you can do scale out parallelism even if you're not uh, across multiple machines, um, it does allow you to like sort of parallelize the collection. You can cause you, of course you know modern machines like even if I'm on one laptop I've got eight cores. Um, What's that? There are, yeah, um, exactly how fidelity, you know, how how much fidelity there is. In my testing, it's like pretty good, uh, especially if you keep the compression relatively low. Um, it's uh, it's surprisingly good. I mean, like that that that's the cumulative distribution. If I plotted the actual CDF of the gamma, it would look like that. Um, but, yeah. Like if you did a Kolmogorov Smirnoff test, I mean, well, the Kolmogorov Smirnoff is going to give you a probability zero that they're the same because you generally have a large enough sample. But like if you just take the d value, the d value is small. It's like you know, point 0.1. So like you know, it's never, it doesn't differ from the real one by more than like a very small fraction at any point in the curve. So any other questions? No. When when do we start working on the notebooks? <laughs> <laughs> so the notebook is the notebook is always gonna be there. You can always go to that URL and experiment with this stuff and, and find bugs and the stuff that has bugs and <laughs> submit a pull request. <laughs> you know, to fix them. Um, I do have a, I mean, I have an implementation of this, which I have more confidence in because it's been unit tested and I spent a lot more time on it, but. Um, you get an exotic question, but why is, I mean, to me, the, the first part of the filters was quite similar to the Calcomy sketch. Yes. So why is, why is Calcomy sketch done? <laughs> or, I mean, was it developed independently? Um, I don't know if there's any reason, you know, the naming of things. Nothing's rational. Uh, <laughs> the, I mean, it's not so important. It's, just curious. it's a good question. I mean, I, you might, I, I think I may have heard this phrase generalized bloom filter before, but um, it's. <clears throat> The guys who wrote the paper decided to call it Count Men Sketch. <laughs> so the time's over. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for your <coughs> job.